Well, you knew it was the 6888. No, not then. I didn't know, didn't what, know it was. That then, no. what it was going to uh, be. We thought we were going to Paris. And we opened our sealed orders one hour after we were in flight and found that we were going to London. We found out that we were going to be in the postal directory service. That's the voice of Lieutenant Colonel Charity Adams Early from an interview recorded back in 1980. In the discussion with the Women's Army Corps Foundation, Charity talked about her experiences enlisting during World War II and in Europe, heading up her own battalion. Tremendous. The 6888 Central Postal, Postal Directory, Directory battalion. battalion. All of them. The women that you called it, the uh, 6888. We call it the 6888. How large a unit was it when you finally were in place? And Well, uh, we had approximately 800 enlisted women and 31 officers. That's a good size battalion. That's a good size battalion. The 6888 was the only predominantly all-black, all-female battalion sent to Europe by the United States during the war. When they arrived in Birmingham, England, they discovered the place a mess, with almost two years of undelivered mail sitting on desks, floors, and in converted hangars. Some estimates were that 17 million pieces of mail had been accumulated. And when we arrived, the Battle of the Bulge, which was between December the 15th, 44, and January 15th, 45, had created an enormous backlog of mail. Just imagine millions of American soldiers and officers in the battlefields, risking their lives every single day. And for every one of those individuals, receiving a letter from a loved one could make all the difference to their morale. Charity Adams knew how important it was and quickly set out to make a difference. Our first job was to deliver the packages that had piled up and the Christmas mail that had piled up from Christmas 1944 that was still back there to get it up. We worked three shifts, eight hours a day, and we did get a commendation for delivering that mail at top speeds. And as can be expected, the unit received a great deal of attention and unfortunately, racism. But Charity wouldn't stand for any sort of distraction. She had a mission to accomplish. The Red Cross wanted to set up another hotel for the Black Wags, and I promised them that it would be over my dead body before anybody slept there, and uh, nobody slept there, to my knowledge. The original estimate was that it would take six months to get the Postal Service there up to date. But because of the effort of those 800-plus women, it only took... Three, those women ensured that every single piece of mail was delivered. I think I would speak for many of the women who say that uh, we are proud of what you did for us and what you did in serving the Army. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For decades, the exploits of Charity Adams and the 6888 Battalion were lost in the pages of history. But in the last decade, a few individuals have made it their mission to shine a spotlight on Colonel Adams and the women who made sure that the mail was delivered. One of those campaigners is Colonel retired Edna Cummings. Edna served over 25 years in the Army, serving senior roles at NORAD, NORTHCOM, Georgetown, and the Pentagon. And since retirement, her biggest endeavor has been to raise awareness about the duties of the 6888, which not only netted the entire unit a Congressional Gold Medal in 2021, but also the renaming of an Army base to Fort Gregg Adams. The Adams, of course, honoring Colonel Charity Adams. Today, we talk to Colonel Cummings about her career, how she proved her father wrong when she became an officer, and chat further about the brave and strong women of the 6888. I'm Carrie Varo Heikis, and this is Army Matters. Hello, everyone. And welcome to Army Matters. I'm Lieutenant General Retired Leslie C. Smith, the Army's former Inspector General. And today, I'm your Vice President for Leadership and Education here at Association of the United States Army. And I'm joined today with my battle buddy, my good friend, 
the guy used to slug it out in the Pentagon with almost every day because all the hard work we had to do. SMA Dan Daly. How you doing, good looking? Sir, I'm doing great. And it's always a pleasure to co-host the Army Matters podcast series with you. I am Dan Daly, the 15th Sergeant of the Army, and now the Vice President for NCO and Soldier Programs here at the Association. So, Les, uh, what do we got in store today? You know, when we talk about a lot of superheroes, and we have a double, double barrel superhero today, I had a chance to look at uh, Colonel Retired Edna Cummings, you know, how you Google people. Yeah, the, you looked her up on the Google machine? I, looked, I was like, oh my gosh. Army Women's Foundation, U.S. Army Reserve, in addition to being a 25-year Army veteran. Army veteran, 25 years. Serving at NORAD and NORTHCOM, Georgetown and the Pentagon. Have you ever done anything at Georgetown, Dan? I did a commissioning ceremony for the yeah. cadets at Georgetown University. So yeah. uh, that counts for something, doesn't it? Yeah, but I, I think she probably actually did some work at Georgetown, <laughs> yeah. other than just yeah. do a commissioning ceremony. <laughs> yeah. They won't let me over there. I'm not smart enough to be over there at Georgetown, but uh, they did let me have the honor to serve as the the cadets commissioning ceremony. And I got a bunch of silver coins out of the deal. That's great. So that worked out well for me. Yeah. So for our audiences, when when an NCO does a commissioning ceremony, they give coins to the senior NCO that that they give the first salute to. So Dan, not not only did commissioning, but he all got some silver coins out of it. Yeah, it's 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 a time honor tradition. So when officer is first commissioned. Um, their first salute, they're supposed to give the enlisted soldier that returns that first salute a silver dollar. So uh, I, do that. I found it lucrative to sign up for those things. Shh, Dan, that's supposed to be a secret. You can't tell anyone about it. <laughs> but you know what we're really here to talk about? The 6888, brother. That was that postal battalion in World War II that miraculously made sure that every soldier got their mail in the European theater of operation. Every single piece. And we know how important mail is. Oh, yeah. Even today. Yeah, and you know how I feel about history. I love history. And yeah. the 6888 has got just storied history. And I love the mission and, and just how, how they accomplished it. But Yeah, that's going to be a great day. Mm-hmm. So what do you think? We should bring our, our guest on today? Yeah. So Edna, welcome to uh, Army Matters. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good to see you. We interview a lot of people, but I think you're one of our first guests that not only has done great things themselves, but we're going to talk about a great organization that you've you spearheaded their recognition. Uh, we appreciate you doing that. Oh, thank you. Before we talk about the 6888, Edna, we want to talk about you. Now, you grew up in an Army family, right? So can you tell us a little bit about your father and what his expectations w- were for you? Were you supposed to follow in his footsteps? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was born at Womack Army Hospital at Fort Bragg, whose name yeah. will soon be changed. So I've yeah. always had an ID card. Yeah. I tell people I was born green. <laughs> and then my dad, Sergeant First Class Willie Cummings, went to Vietnam as part of that first group of advisors and was severely wounded, but survived. And then he went back in 69. But he also served in Korea, and when he was in Korea, he was part of the a segregated artillery unit. Mm-hmm. My father retired around 73, I believe, because we were in college about the same time. Mm-hmm. Everyone I was reading about, I would call him and says, uh, tell me what really happened in Korea during the Korean War when the artillery unit did something. He said, oh, yeah, we bust a hole through, and you let, you know, we... At the troops, you know, going through, they couldn't get it unless we had done it. It was segregated. So he would just tell me all these stories, and that sparked mm-hmm. my interest. But when I told him I was joining the Army, he didn't want me to go in. He did not want me to join. But then when I told him I was going in as an officer, he acquiesced okay. because he realized that I would have some opportunities that I may not have if I'd just gone in, enlisted. He didn't even think of the possibility of me being an officer until I told him, like, hey, Dad, you know, women can join Army ROTC now. So, Edna, tell us, did you always want to join the Army? Well, it was a path I wanted to take until I did not want to take it. <laughs> okay. I went through Army ROTC in college at Appalachian State, go Mountaineers, but that's another conversation. Yeah, well, we, we need to talk about it. I, I went to Georgia Southern, so you're our oh, wow. arch nemesis. Yes, I know, but Brr. we digressed. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I went to Appalachian State, and at the time, post-Vietnam, a lot of anti-war sentiment on campus. Right. 
and just an overall resentment from a lot of the college professors about the military. But I was the only African-American female in the ROTC class. Okay. There were other females in ROTC, but I was the first African-American female to receive a commission from Appalachian State. And once I started, other African-American women uh, joined the program. Okay. So when I came in the Army, it was very restrictive for women. It was a mindset that you are still here to support the combat units. Back then, it was combat support. Mm -hmm. We could not join combat arms, only combat support. So I became a logistician. Okay. And my first assignment was at Fort Rucker. It was a combat-heavy engineer battalion, which was interesting because women could not be assigned to combat units, but we could be attached. Okay. So combat heavy for everybody. It's a l large engineer equipment that did a lot of road work, a lot of bridge work, a lot of all those things. So that that was interesting because there were no other females in that battalion. Okay. And it was it was tough, but I have to thank Doc Bonson. He was the aviation brigade commander who just open doors. He provided me that top cover and said, if you need anything, call me. And I'm a second lieutenant. So when a colonel says, hey, call me if you need something, <laughs> you know, I was naive. Yeah. I didn't know. Right. But the lesson learned from that was when you put people in a situation when they're the only, I don't care what only you are, they need some support and top cover. Right. And that's what Doc Bonson did for me. And I'm forever grateful. I actually sent him a note uh, not too long ago and he wrote me back. He was a tanker, aviator, and imposing. Okay. But he was one of the most effective and kindest person I ever met. He taught me how to cuss, and you said I couldn't cuss on this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. He, he basically said, you need to toughen up. You know, he, he, he would give me some candid responses to share, but I'm a second lieutenant. I didn't know, right. but right. I, I'm forever grateful to Doc Bonson. Edna, you went on to have an amazing career in the Army. But let's talk about something else. In the last few years, you've devoted an incredible amount of time to raising awareness of the 6888, the all-female, all-black postal directory battalion. Now, can you kind of set the scene for us? I mean, things like, what were the conditions like for the battalion when they first arrived at the war? The 6888 uh, was a unique unit. And so in 1942, the army opened its ranks to women. About 150,000 women served on active duty during World War II. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed. That meant the women served with the army and not in the army. And 440 women was in that first class at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. 10% of those slops were reserved for African-Americans to reflect their population at the time. 39 attended. And of that 39 was a now captain, Charity Adams, who became the first African-American woman to receive uh, a commission. Yeah. Charity Adams was part of that first class, along with some other African-American women, had assignments throughout the U.S. But African-American women were not serving overseas Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, they worked with the War Department and African-American organizations to afford Black women the opportunity to serve overseas in meaningful roles. And what's interesting about women who served in World War II, they all had to be high school graduates. And the men did not. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. The literacy levels in the U.S. were just extremely low. So about 50% of eligible draftees were, could not uh, join the military. They could not write, only sign their names with an X. But the women had to be better. So you had women of color, diverse population of women, over 6,000 strong. So finally, General Eisenhower supported allowing African-American women to come to the European theater of operations. But the requirement was they had to serve in meaningful roles. Wow. So anyway, the 6888 formed and was modeled after the invasion post office 
in uh, the United Kingdom. And Charity Adams was assigned as the commander, but Mm -hmm. she didn't know what her assignment was. She knew that women would be going overseas. So she received an envelope and says, all right, get on a plane. You can open the envelope once you're midair. No, by the way, it's a no fail mission to the extent Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune sent her a telegram saying to send the six triple later telegram before they departed from Camp Shanks, uh, New York says, you represent 15 million of us. Do well, carve a niche for yourself. 15 million being the African-American women in the United States, because going abroad, regardless of who you are in the 40s on a luxury boat, the Ile de France, I mean, that's a great period. Right. Because a lot of commercial uh, liners have been converted to troop ships. So you have these volunteers. The first contingent was about 738. And they didn't know what their mission was until they got probably midway through. I understand they learned about their mission to clear the backlog of mail. And clear it, they did. Now, we've got all sorts of questions. But first, we got to take a quick break. Does your company or organization want to show their support for the Army in the local community while also receiving access to networking opportunities and membership benefits? Join AUSA in our mission to educate, inform, and connect America's Army through our Community Partnership Program. Annual rates start at $175. For more information, please view our Community Partner page at ausa.org slash membership. We're back with Edna Cummings. Now, Edna, when did you first hear about the 6888? Well, I learned about the 6888 probably in 2016, 17. Um, You all use the term, you were on the Google. On the Google. (laughs) You you are on, you Googleable, right. That's That's right. right. I was on the Google. Right. Um, I happened to, I think it just popped up in my feed around 2016, 17, or somewhere sometime during that time. And I was impressed by this black woman in uniform named Edna. Her name was Charity Edna Adams. So that caught my attention. Oh, there's the connection. There's a connection. There's the connection. Yeah. And her leadership style was interesting. She had a very unconventional style. Um, She's known for telling a general, you know, over my dead body. And I could connect to that. I never told a general over my dead body because that's not how majors talk to generals. And sir, I think you can attest to that. Yes. Yes. Then in 2018, I'm a member of the group called The Rocks, and they were, Mm -hmm. um, I think, selling tickets online for the spring formal. Spring formal. That's right. Yeah. But The Rocks also on that website had donate to this monument for the 6888. Yeah. And I recognized the name of the project director. So I called him. I'm like, Okay, I made a donation. I called. And I said, well, do you need any help? And an hour, hour and a half later, I was part of the East Coast fundraising <laughs> team for the 6888 Monument. Yep. And while we were raising money for the monument, this uh, film producer, James Ferris, had uh, produced a f- documentary about the Hello Girls, Hello Girls were World War I telephone operators mm-hmm. who put calls through for General Pershing. And when they returned to the U.S., the Army said they were never soldiers. So he contacted our fundraising team and says, I'd like to do a documentary because there are similarities. You have women restoring vital communications in theater and nobody, and nobody honored them once they returned. Very similar. Yeah. We wove the story together. Now, also, while I was working on the monument, the documentary, again, James Therris, he says, why don't you uh, introduce Congressional Gold Medal for the 6888? And he says, yeah, we did it for the Hello Girls. Apparently, a congressional staffer had attended one of the docu- screenings for the Hello Girls and thought it would be a good idea to introduce uh, legislation for the Hello Girls. And so I'm like, okay. Again, relying on Pentagon Staff Officer 101, says, well, give me a template. And basically, I drafted the legislation, which is a statement of facts, but the facts have to be so compelling until members of Congress have to read it. 
says, this is something I can support. Mm -hmm. So the smartest person on Capitol Hill was Senator Jerry Moran from Kansas. Uh, Senator Moran attended the monument dedication in November 2018. He was very familiar with all the work that uh, the project director had done to erect these monuments. And he talked about how the 6888 kept his family together. His father was in World War II. His mom worked at a J.C. Penney store. And Senator Gwen Moore from Wisconsin introduced that legislation. She was a classmate of a young lady whose mom was in the 6888 from Wisconsin. So you had wow. two people who were very connected to the 6888, and that's what we needed. That's amazing. For our listeners out there, we're not going to have time today to tell the, the incredible story of the 6888. But what I, I invite you to do is research it. Just take a moment and you will be inspired about what these women did. They're definitely Googleable. I just found a video. Yes. Yeah, and not just in one location. Yes. Yeah, all across the theater. That's uh, right. Uh, they're in the European front. Um, they just did incredible work. But Edna, can you talk about two of the members of 6888 that you felt a connection with and, and share their fascinating story, please? Because of D-Day preparations, Battle of the Bulge, the mail had been piled up for two to three years. I read one article where the 255th Port Company uh, that landed uh, at Normandy, you know, part of that first wave, had offloaded 130,000 bags of mail, 3,600 tons alone. And the 6888 was assigned to do just that, reduce the backlog of mail. So they did it in record time, processing upwards of 65,000 pieces of mail per uh, shift, three-day shift, 24-7 operations, estimated about 17 million pieces of mail and backlog just in Birmingham alone, which was the hub of operations for the mail during World War II. When we started working with raising funds for the monument, approximately about 14 women or so still alive. Now there are six women who are still alive. The youngest is 99. The oldest turns 104 this year. Wow. That's amazing. Some of the women, some of the stories that stuck with me, one in particular is Vashti Murphy Matthews. Matthews is part of a family that's well known, I would say, throughout the world, because her father was a co-publisher of the Afro newspaper. And at the time, the black press was so crucial to World War II, the Pittsburgh Courier uh, started a campaign known as a double V campaign, victory abroad, victory at home for rights, because this was still Jim Crow America. So Vashti Murphy, her father owned the newspaper and the Afro newspaper sent war correspondents to the European theory of operations. And I didn't know that there were African-American war correspondents in theater. The other story is one of my favorite, Major Fannie McClendon. She's still alive in um, Arizona. Major McClendon was a first lieutenant in the army with the 6888. When she returned to the U.S., she said she received some mail from uh, the army, says, hey, you want to come back in? So she went to the recruiter, and apparently the Air Force recruiter and the Army recruiters were there together. So she ended up joining the Air Force. when, At the beginning, when the Air Force became a branch in 47 and retired in 1971 Wow! as a major in the Air Force. And I'm pretty sure she has to be one of the first women officers in the Air Force. And she married uh, someone else who was in the military. So you have this dual military couple in the 50s and 60s where you just don't think of dual militaries. But some of the women in the 6888 joined because their fiancé was serving in the European theater. And we have documentation of marriages occurring, <laughs> you know, abroad uh, during World War II with the 6888. And I think the 6888 was so successful because they were some of the best and brightest in the nation, um, considering the literacy levels, their experiences abroad. I mean, the Army changes you. It taps inside leadership skills that you don't know you have. Yeah. And I can say you don't know your skills and talents until it's time to use it. And I think under the leadership of uh, Charity Adams, 
She had to be a Mensa. She tripled major in math, Latin, physics when she was at Wilberforce. Now, hold, hold on now. You got to say that again. Triple major. Math, Latin, and physics. Yeah, she's a triple math, Latin, and physics as an undergrad at Wilberforce. When she joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, she was in graduate school at Ohio State for vocational psychology. Wow. Making lieutenant colonel in... What, three and a half years. It takes a little bit longer now. Yeah, it does. She married a fellow officer, I mean, a fellow soldier who was brilliant, someone they've met at Wilberforce. And he was enlisted, but had a, was gifted uh, with languages. Mm -hmm. So he was a POW interpreter. He was fluent in French. Uh, and because of segregation, he had to go to school and medical school in Switzerland. So Charity Adams got off active duty, followed him to Switzerland while he's in medical school. She took courses. This is in the 40s, mm -hmm. something that you don't even think about. So they settled in Dayton, Ohio, mm. eventually. And um, Dr. Early is a legend within himself. I mean, his story, the Army Times, I think, just did a good story a piece on him. about yeah. the Early family. So you can learn more about uh, Stanley Early and Charity Early post-war as well as during the war. You know, we have like 20 more questions, but we can really ask only one more. So what's the proudest thing that you've done about enhancing the legacy of the 6888? What would you say that one thing is? I believe the Congressional Gold Medal, because what the Congressional Gold Medal does is secures the 6888's place in history. The first recipient of the Congressional Gold Medal was in 1776, and that was General George Washington before he became president. And since 1776, less than 200 uh, Congressional Gold Medals have been awarded uh, to institutions or individuals who have contributed to this nation be it culture, leadership, or just an array of areas. And the 6888 is the only military women's unit to receive this honor. Wow. World War II, uh, the contributions of African-American women were deleted. I would not say they were invisible. I challenge any of our listeners to look at any World War II movie, historical information, you will not see anything, at least I haven't seen anything, about black women serving in World War II, where we had nurses, aid workers, members of the Women's Army Corps, and the Air Force was part of the Army, so you know I'll remind our Air Force listeners. But no one ever talked about black women serving in World War II. So just on that alone, I think bringing this story of the contributions of women of color during World War II to the forefront has been very rewarding. And the conversation continues. Actor Blair Underwood is working on a Broadway-bound musical. There's a Netflix movie uh, being released sometime soon. People are now beginning to talk and highlight the service of African-American women and women of color who were unrecognized who served during World War II. Yeah, that's good. The greatest generation that no one ever talked about. Now, Edna... We were both able to attend the renaming ceremony for Fort Greg Adams. And I know Lieutenant General Greg personally. And for me, it made me really feel a sense of pride and, and understanding who he is and where he came from. How did you feel when you saw Charity Adams' name up there? Well, I felt, if speechless is a feeling, and I'm going to make it one because I almost, it was numbing. I didn't know that was a possibility. And in retrospect, you never know who's listening, watching, or paying attention. I didn't know that Charity Adams' name had been submitted until later. So our efforts, just talking about it with passion and earnest and sharing these stories, and regardless of the effort, you never know who's paying attention. And so if speechless is a feeling, maybe numb. I, I'm i still trying to process it. And I don't, I don't want to pay too much attention to it because it paralyzes me. Like this is really happening. And I feel you. I felt the very same way. So see, Dan, what did I tell you, brother? We're talking to a superhero that's elevating other superheroes. 
Well, did you all learn something? I mean, that's that's I'm that inner teacher in me. Uh, what yeah, did you I'm, all? I'm lo- taking a lot of notes. Look at yeah. look at all that. Oh look well. At all that. <laughs> well, any any aha moments? Uh, so, you know, uh, Dan, I'll ask you. Did you have any aha moments? I knew that there was a lot of illiterate soldiers because I, I have a lot of history knowledge of why we created the enlisted education system. But I didn't know that the the women's army corps um, are, were required to have a high school diploma. That I did not know that. Yeah. I'm going to go do some research on it, but yeah, um, it's incredible. And this, I, I think yeah. things like that are what, when people listen to this podcast, it's going to inspire them to go yeah. do the research on it. Right. Yeah. And then we hear about, you know, the GI Bill and African-Americans yeah. during World War II. A lot of it had to do with just navigating the system. Yeah, that's right. And 85% of the six triple eight women had college degrees or school teachers. Wow. wow. So when they returned to the U.S., I mean, they were able to navigate the system. I mean, it's hard yeah. now, but because yeah. of their exposure, they use the GI Bill. Most of them, everyone I talked to, uh, went back to college or either bought homes. But if you listen to some of the rhetoric now, you do not get that. It just depends on where you were in the access. And that was a lot of it. So that's something that was an aha moment for me. And uh, this entire episode has been an aha moment for me. Thank you so much for coming in today and taking time to talk to us. Yeah, thanks, Edna. Thank you so much for your support. AUSA uh, was there from the beginning, so I cannot thank them um, enough because you helped shape history. So thank you for that. Edna Cummings is just one of so many individuals that spend a great deal of time showing gratitude to Army leaders of past and present. In today's Chapter Spotlight, we'd like to focus on an organization doing the same. On April 3rd, the Fort Riley Central Kansas Chapter hosted its first ever AUSA Community Partner Legacy Award Night. Held at the Fort's Spare Time Interactive Entertainment Center, the event celebrated its community partners as well as increased the profile of AUSA and Fort Riley. Over 70 attended, including board members, Army leaders from the 1st Infantry Division, and community partners. Awards were presented to the chapter's top partners, and everyone had a great time. Congrats to everyone at Fort Riley. If you or your chapter would like to be profiled on the show, please email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Hua. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the Total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith and SMA Retired Dan Daly, an anchor hosted by Carrie Barrow Heckes. Anthony Del Call is the producer and writer, and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Viral Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Special thanks to Lauren Hall and Terry Perriman for their help. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast primary purpose is to entertain. The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guest. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hua.